Have you ever wondered how famous authors create a world so rich and intense that it feels more real than the country right next to your own? In today's episode, we are going to be talking about world building and your setting. Probably one of the most exciting things that I ever get to talk about and I am thrilled that you are here with me today, so stay tuned. Hi, if this is the first time visiting my channel, my name is Zoe Marley and I am dedicated and committed to bringing you 50 videos about tips and techniques to help improve your writing. In today's video, we are going to be talking about the setting, world building. All right, y'all, this is very serious. In one of my previous videos, I lied to you and I want to tell you what I lied about. I told you that I was going to give you a challenge that was the easiest challenge I will ever give you and that was in fact not true. Today is the easiest challenge I will ever give to you before we get started. I just want to go over a very quick little exercise. Imagine you're in the Shire. There are two young hobbits named Frodo and Sam leaving the hillsides of the home they have always known. As they walk, they come across a yellow brick road and they need to know where it leads. On the horizons, there are cackling witches and flying monkeys. But closer is a cupboard, a very old wooden cupboard. And when they open it up, and they reach inside and it has all of these modern day wool coats. Curious, they push them aside and they keep walking. Instead of going into this snowy forest of Narnia, they come across something else. Suddenly, they're unable to get their footing down. They're moving and they can't figure out where they are. However, we know where they are. They're on top of the moving staircases of Hogwarts and the staircases guiding them to their very next venture. The staircase moves over and Sam and Frodo hop over to the next landing. In front of them is a giant moving picture showing all of these happy, merry people inside of a very, very old tavern. Excited. Sam and Frodo think they have finally found what they have been looking for, the prancing pony. They hop through the portrait and something is just a little different. The room is no longer excited and chattery. They're quiet and all of their focus is on one lone bard who begins to strum his lute. And all of a sudden this bard begins to sing. I will spare you the rest of my singing, but you get the point. Exercise is over. How many worlds did we go to? I'm from the United States of America and all of the worlds, whether it was Oz or Hogwarts, all of these fantasy settings seem more real to me than Canada. They even seem more real to me than Hawaii. And today we're going to be discussing how you're going to do it. At the end of this video, I'm going to be going over one tip that I do when world building that it hopefully is going to change everything for you. There are tons of ways to do this. In the description below, I'm going to link some very common questions, some very good guides that I think that if you want to just sit there and brainstorm one day, this is a really good a set of questions or a very good guide to really look at and get the get your world fleshed out the best it can be. All right, so we're going to dig into the very basics very, very quickly. There are three types of fantasy worlds. First, there is the portal fantasy. This is where something connects your world and this other world. So in fantasy, think of Narnia, right? You have the cupboard and you go through this cupboard and you are in a completely different world. 
And in something like sci-fi, you could go through a wormhole and be on a completely different world, or you could take a spaceship to a literally a different planet, right? This is what I consider portal fantasy. Number two is high fantasy. This is where I love to live. This is a completely made up world. There are the maps, there are the countries, there are all of these different things that I just think are amazing. Examples of this is going to be Lord of the Rings. It's going to be Game of Thrones. It's going to be The Witcher. The third type is going to be the low fantasy. This is where it's our world, but there's fantastical elements within this world. So think Harry Potter. Yes, Hogwarts is almost like a completely different world, but it's still within ours. Think the mummy, right? It is within our world, but they unleashed the mummy and now all of these insane things happen, which for the record, that is like one of my favorite movies ever. I know some of you are like, oh my gosh, where do I start? I can't even begin to dream this stuff up. How do, how do I start this? It's okay, I'm here with you. Now, if you've been following along my videos, you should already have a spark. If you don't know what the spark is, see this video. I, I think I got a thing up there. You're gonna start with your spark. Okay, there's a reason that my first video, as horrible as it really was and as painful as it is for me to watch how nervous I was, there's a reason that was my very first video and in my opinion, that's because that is the glue that holds everything together. So start with your spark. What did you see? What did you imagine? How can you fit the elements that you saw into this setting? The next thing you're going to do if you haven't seen this video, I highly suggest it. I'm gonna put a thingy right up here. And this is talking about writing the novel that you want to read. In it, I suggested that you write all of your favorite things down. It doesn't matter if they make sense. It doesn't matter what they come from. That's what today's video is gonna be about. Just write them down, get them out there, put them out into the world, okay? Now you're gonna look at that list and you're gonna go, okay, are any of these things fantasy related, world related, setting related? In my case, I had so many ideas that were purely based off of my favorite settings in history. So this is going to be easier for someone like me who does that. The character development part of starting my story was very hard because I didn't really come up with many ideas of the characters or types of characters that I wanted in my story. I pretty much had nothing but setting and races. And that makes world building for me way easier when it comes from the setting perspective, not so easy when it comes from the casting and character perspective. So what do you do? You went to your list, you looked over it again, and you're like, oh my gosh, I had no settings. Your list can change. It is living and breathing and it can change as much as you change and that is the beautiful thing about this process. Okay, so this video is going to get intense and intense pretty fast. Before we get into this super, super, super info dump I'm about to do on you, realize there's one more important thing to know. But if you're focusing on one book, you need to start with the ordinary world and then you need to start thinking about what the next world will be. So this is part one. What does your main character show up in? This is probably what you thought of when you saw the spark. And then number two, what is the world your character will end up going into? So there's this like crossing of the threshold. There is this different life. Your character has to leave their ordinary world and they have to venture to something else. So when you're doing this, you want to focus on these two things and you want to make them very opposite of one another. But let's be real. How many fantasy and sci-fi authors out there really only make one book? So if you're writing a series, you kind of have to put a little bit more thought into it. So a series, let's say it's a trilogy. If you have one book, you have three parts. You have the beginning, the middle, and the end. If you're writing a trilogy, 
your trilogy is going to follow the same structure. Book one will be the beginning. Book two will be the middle. And book three will be one epic end. That does not say that your book needs to be so long. That is only part one. Each book will have within it part one, two, and three. But when you're looking at the series from a bird's eye view, you're gonna have part one, part two, and part three of your series. In book one, you will be going through the entire process. Your character will start somewhere, they will end in a completely different place, and then the ending happens. Then when you start book two, they will be in where that ending happens, but they have to go back through another place. And it's probably best that it's not the same place in book one. You're going to be repeating these steps throughout every single book you write within the series, whether it's a trilogy or not. All right, so to give you guys some examples, right now I'm taking a look at my PowerPoint presentation. It's not very good. This is pretty much where I keep all of my information. I hope to do it better in the future, but I really don't know how. So I just stick everything into PowerPoint and hope it works out for me, okay? And for the beginning of my story, I have a humongous cast. 90% of these people don't even make it into the story, but for reasons that you will learn later on, my main character has like over 25 brothers and sisters. And so I wanted them all named. I wanted to have looks to them. I wanted everything to be seen from that particular perspective. So to start, I drew and built a map. It took me a few times for me to get it. I had it on paper and then I eventually converted over to like a mapping software. I'll leave the link to it below in the description. And this is how I made my map. And I totally think that if you are world building, especially for a giant fantasy setting, that you should go and build your own map. You can add names, you can add everything to it later on but at least in the beginning you have a few random places you have a few bits of inspiration and all of that is it's going to be built into your map but as we move down we're going to get into different settings and so i did name them and i named them very closely to the tribe that i wanted to name them after like I said, I am absolutely huge into history. I would never say that I'm a historian, but because it's what I love so much, it is something that I wanted to incorporate heavily into my story and I wanted to be inspired by so many different things. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to be showing kind of the castle here and then this lake that I got inspired by. And then I'm gonna be showing her and so this is Isola. Um, I'm not sure how late into the series I will actually introduce her, but she has a main part. She's one of the first people I imagined and I absolutely adore. And so these are just some pictures that I got off of Pinterest and I really just thought she was the most beautiful person. She was exactly what I saw for this role. All right, so the next place that I'm gonna introduce you to is Urat. Now this is actually taken from the northern Mongol tribes of Beryat. So you'll see in this particular area, I have what their homes look like, and then I have kind of what the setting looks like next to it because they don't always match together. So this is also kind of in the north. It's not a complete northern wasteland, but it is a very hard place to survive. So again, I have some notes right here that are in white. I don't know why. <laughs> Those are my notes. I'll end up changing it. I haven't had time to really make this the prettiest thing in the world, but I did want to show you just kind of like what I have and what it looks like. And so here's some character inspirations. So I kind of know the feeling of this particular tribe. So the next place that I'm going to be showing you is called Imba. And this is going to be based off of the Himba tribes in Africa. In addition to some of the traditional things that you would see in the Himba tribe, I also merged it with one of my favorite things. If you remember, I put voodoo in there. So the Imbas are very big into voodoo. They keep a lot of skulls. It's a very swamp-like magical place. Next is kind of the way I see the Imba people. In the actual Himba tribe, you see that they have like clay on their hair. They have um, 
orange put on their skin. They're very unique and very beautiful. And I don't know why I don't have a picture included here. I will change that though, because that is what the majority of the people look like in my opinion. These specific people are the tribal leaders and it's a brother and sister that work together. And so they have this very unique beautiful freckling on their skin. So my next area is going to be the tribe Asai, and this is based off of Maasai. I've got these beautiful painted buildings. I've got this beautiful setting, kind of what their camps look like. And here's some of the character inspiration for my Asai tribe. So the four light area starts at the very top and goes all the way down. And so we're kind of moving down on my map a little bit. From here we have the grove that I won't talk about because it's super secret. So the next place that I'm going to be going into is my Manoyami, which is inspired by the South American tribes Yanomami. Again, here's what their huts look like. This is kind of a more fantastical setting of how their area will be looking like. And then down at the bottom you see children and you see kind of like the smaller places. These are the people that I have that I draw inspiration from for my characters. So I know you're like, didn't you say this was based off of Native Americans? <laughs> it started that way. And then I thought, oh my gosh, there's so many different cool tribal cultures in the world that I can implement. And then there's going to be a lot of tension because they're very different and they're going to have different beliefs, but they're united by like one enemy, right? <clears throat> so my next one is going to be Temecula. And this was my original inspiration for the four lie. And here are some different pictures. So I was inspired by the Navajo. And so their names in my story are Avajo. So when it comes to the naming, maybe I'm going to change the names. I don't really know yet, but right now it's easiest for me to keep the names as close as possible to the tribes that I was inspired by. And that is because when I'm writing, I'm usually not looking at pictures. So I can immediately refer to what tribe does what, and maybe I'll do a search and replace later on and change the names. But I also like the idea of people knowing that I pulled this from places in real life and maybe that will encourage them to look at history maybe that will encourage them to look at these different tribes in the world and even today many of these tribes still exist and they have these amazing traditions that even if you're not a part of you can join and you can research and it, it's just amazing so the next tribe is closest to the ocean and they are inspired by the maori i call them the Aori and they are based off of the tribes in New Zealand. So you have this very amazing structures that I have. And so you'll usually see that I have the actual structures of the tribes and then I have the fantasy structure of the tribe. And I really feel like combining the two is going to be that breath of fresh air for me. So here are just some character inspiration photos for me. So Something that's really cool is they have the traditional tattoos on the face, the tamako. Another thing that I really like about their culture is they have this um, nose to nose greeting and it's called the hongi. And it is just a really beautiful way to greet people. It's like, it's how you would greet family and to imagine all of these people greeting each other like family, even if they're strangers, is just really beautiful to me. So the next area that I'm going to be bringing into the picture is this area right here. And this is going to be your stereotypical European medieval places. They each have their own little flair to them. It's being ruled by a monarch. And then you've got all of these little sub monarchs in the other towns. And of course I've got all of my places and people. So this area up here is going to be the land of the tainted. Of course, they don't call themselves that. And this is going to be my ancient India and ancient Egyptian place kind of put into one. It's really interesting. The main areas and the main cities and the way it's governed is based off of the ancient India ways. But the, and then they have this subsect of them, which is a mix between ancient Egypt and the Aztecs. And it's probably hands down my favorite part of the story. I don't know why. It's just very brutal and very cool, but it is just this very small portion like hidden right up here. <clears throat> the rest of it over here is based off of ancient India, but this, this little part right here, 
It's my favorite part of my entire world. Of course, so I've got different pictures and I've got it divided by the cities because the cities are just very different among them. Up here in this little sliver, if you want to look at it in a real fantasy way, this is kind of where my high elves live, right? And so it is, imagine Niagara Falls. It is on top of Niagara Falls and completely separated from the rest of the world and that is how they like it. So here's some inspiration photos for that. This is obviously a uh, fantasy picture that I just find absolutely breathtaking and beautiful. And here's some other parts of it that just remind me of it. And so here's some more cities. So the next place, I, you'll see I have no names on this area. That's because it's just ideas and I haven't, I haven't decided on names yet. I haven't decided completely on people. This is something that's going to be brought into my later books. Perfect. So in the next few flip throughs, you'll kind of see inspiration photos that I have very quickly for this area. And that's how I start. So you can kind of see, okay, she drew a map and now she's got some pictures. Then I'll probably do the naming and then I'll really dig deep into the different cultures that I want to put in this area. All right, so the last part of my world is this little part down here. It is very small. And earlier I mentioned my Atlantis and how it's ruled by probably the worst person in my book. This is where that is. So here's some very different fantasy art elements about my Atlantis. I, I call it Serenity City in my story. That may change, I don't know. I'll say it a million times, this is a living, breathing document. Things are gonna change and that's okay. All right, so now on to the tip about how I engage my readers through this world building setting process. In the description below, I give you a link to many common questions that you can ask during this world building process. Check out that link. I want you to imagine a place and then I want you with every question, instead of just answering the first thing that comes to your mind, I want you to answer with the opposite assumption. You are going to see that it is a common theme with me that I love to turn assumptions on people's heads. I absolutely love it. I love it when people do it to me. I think it's fabulous. And I think that in today's world, in today's writing, there's so many tropes, there's so many stereotypes that if you don't intentionally think, how can I make this so different and so unpredictable, that your story may be really well written and really awesome, but it won't be mind blowing. Let me give you an example about how I am doing this in my current work in progress. One of the first races you see is a race called the Four Lie. And this race started off as an idea to be the fairy race. So first is what do people assume when they think of a fairy race and how can I make mine different? Well, it was really interesting because I knew I wanted to mix the Native American culture into the fairy race. I wanted it to have this feeling of druids and shamans. And so I wanted that Native American, that tribal part to be in this quote unquote fairy race. With the Native Americans being my primary inspiration for this fairy race, there were a few things that I wanted to make sure that I also did. <clears throat> One of the first things I wanted to do with this race is I wanted them to have to actually deal with some of the horrible things that Native Americans had to deal with when settlers first came over. The second thing that I wanted to do when using Native Americans as an inspiration. So for example, I feel like there are some really backwards ways of thinking when it comes to Native Americans. You know, I think that um, most people from the United States will immediately think of scalping. You know, a lot of people, especially the older generation, they were huge into Westerns. They were huge into John Wayne, right? It was always cowboys against Indians and Indians weren't really painted in the right light. 
Then there are also things like Indian givers. I suggest if you use this term to do some research on the background of Indian givers. It's kind of like the rule of thumb. Once you see where that common phrase came from, you probably won't use it again. So when I think of fairies, nymphs, dryads, I initially think of females and I think about seducing men for whatever reason. I also wanted to change this common stereotype to be something a little more real in my opinion. I, I wanted to create this race to be very open sexually, to, to not be constrained by the idea of marriage. And marriage in general is a huge theme in my novel. You'll see how it impacts almost every one of my characters' lives, whether they are married or they aren't married. You'll see how that goes through my novel. And so something that I wanted to really do was I wanted to show a culture that was completely open-minded to sexuality. The fourth assumption that I wanted to flip on its head is whenever you look at tribal cultures, for some reason, there is this stigma that they are ill-educated. In most fantasy settings, you have high elves and you have gnomes, and these two are, are usually the highest educated types out there, and they have these big fancy structures to prove it. In my setting, I didn't want intelligence to merely look like a place with fancy structures. I also wanted to show how much value different tribes bring to the world. And I want to show this value through their education, through their proficiencies. I wanted to highlight these qualities because if you think about your typical fantasy settings, you have like trolls and orcs that are apparently dumber than dirt. Why? Why is that the same in every single setting? I don't understand it. When you look at tribal races, that should not be the stereotype. And that is something that I want to flip on its head. So the fifth thing that I want to go over today, and I promise you it's the last thing, is how settings are done. How are they ran? So I feel like there needs to be a wide diversity in this. When you're looking at your entire map, which ones are ruled by dictators? Do you have councils for any of them? What are the different ways these places are ruled? Now, I'm also going to encourage you to also take the stereotype, take that first assumption and change it. So in this particular situation, I have a setting that is heavily inspired by Atlantis, which is Greek, which you would think would maybe be split up into city-states and governed that way. But no, I don't want that to be the assumption. So what I have is I have one ruling dictator and he is absolutely terrible. He's probably just on an individual level, one of the worst people in the entire books, but you don't really get to see that. So another way that I do this is I have another area that is heavily inspired by China. And when you think of ancient China, you think about emperors and dynasties. And in this particular case, I didn't make their governing bodies reflect that emperor or dynasty or anything like that because I wanted to change that initial assumption that people would have. To me, this builds interest. And if you're building interest and people aren't able to predict every little part of your book, then you're going to have engaged readers that are going to want to keep flipping the pages. In my opinion, as a writer, that is one of our number one goals. All right, so if you got value out of this, please press that like button. If you want to see more of me, hit subscribe, ring that bell. I am committed to bringing you guys 50 videos on tips and techniques to write your story. So remember, write now or never. Thank you.